Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Happy Tuesday to you if you're if you're listening to us on Tuesday. Great. If you're listening to us on Wednesday, that's fine, too. We're okay with that. In fact, if you don't already subscribe to the podcast, do us a favor. Make sure wherever you get your audio that you uh, go check out Silver and Black today. Uh, subscribe and put on the auto download. That way, every time we have a new show, guess what? It's going to come right to you. So we appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being with us. I say us. That is myself, Scott Branson, your humble host, along with my partner. And that is Mr. Mo Moten. He is the senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. Also, the Raiders columnist at SportsNot.com. You can follow him on X.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully. You can also follow my work up on SportsNot. Dot com. Uh, you know, Mo, not much going on in the world of Raider Nation. I kid, I kid, I kid. Uh, the Antonio Pierce era begins. This is our first show since the official naming of Antonio Pierce as the coach. So we're going to delve into that a little bit. And clearly, a lot of excitement amongst the fan base, a lot of excitement amongst the players. The players wanted Antonio Pierce. We we talked last time and last week about Max Crosby's statements. We heard from Devontae Adams. We've heard from Josh Jacobs. Heard from a lot of players who really uh, took to Antonio Pierce as he took over the head coach. Obviously, the results were better as he compiled a 5-4 and four record as the interim head coach. And so uh, it begins. Just want to get off the top, Mo, your, your view of the hire. We'll get into the process one last time here in a second, but I want to talk about uh, just the fact that here's Antonio Pierce brings a lot of energy, brings a different type of mentality to this head coaching position. Give me your give me your take uh, on the hire itself. On the hire itself, basically, this was the most logical, reasonable hire. Uh, I know a lot of people have heard us talk about Jim Harbaugh being option one. Uh, Vic said that. Mark Davis was in contact with Harbaugh's agent. I don't know how long, how far along those talks went, but it doesn't seem like Harbaugh had drawn much traction with the Raiders. Mm -hmm. So if, they, if you're not going to go with a proven winner at where he's gone, then you go with the guy who turned around the locker room. As everyone knows, Raiders go three and five, then they go five and four. AP comes in, immediately rejuvenates the locker room. Players, as you said, are campaigning for him. The media actually said that he deserved the, deserved the job. I, I watched countless uh, media outlets and pundits say, you know, Antonio Pierce deserves the job. And uh, it seems like that's what Mark Davis is leaning all along because the only other two interviews were Chris Richard, who was a former Saints co-defensive coordinator in 2022, didn't coach last year, and Leslie Frazier, who didn't coach last year, left the Buffalo Bills uh, for whatever reason, uh, re reasons weren't revealed. But basically, Antonio Pierce is going up against two coaches who hadn't coached last year. So if you look at the writing on the wall, it seems like Mark Davis is leaning <laughs> that way all along, even before the Max Crosby comments. Yeah. So, um, again, to me, it was the safe choice to go with Antonio Pierce and uh, keep not necessarily keep the status quo, but – maintain continuity and build on what the Raiders had started at five and four under on his watch. Yeah. The continuity I think was a big deal there. And, 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 and I don't disagree with anything you said there. Clearly Mark Davis uh, had his mind made up and that's where we get into the process thing. And this, again, this is about uh, not Antonio Pierce. We'll get into his, his process and the, the work ahead for him in the next segment. But when you look at the process, you know, you have to go back to what Mark Davis said. Now, for those of you who wanted Antonio Pierce, number one, didn't want any other options, totally fine. And so you're not going to like when we talk about this because the process, Mark Davis said, we go back to the athletic interview with Tashawn Reed, I think it was, who where he said, look, last time I rushed into it, I knew what I wanted to do before the season even ended. I was going after Josh McDaniels. Now, I know it's a little different because uh, Antonio Pierce was the coach of the Raiders already, okay? But he said he was not going to rush into it. He didn't necessarily rush into it, but he did make up his mind already. Because clearly, as you mentioned, the two candidates that interviewed for the role officially were not really candidates at all. Okay, let's be let's be real here. Everybody knows that. And so to me, the process was there. He also said he wanted to hire the GM first. That has not happened. We now know, and we're going to talk about that later on too, about the GM process. So my question for you, though, is even though Everyone seems to be on board, happy with, and supportive of the decision Mark Davis made. So in most people's minds, it's a good decision. 
the way in which he made made the decision is interesting to me, Mo. I know some people don't care, and that's fine. But when you're running a franchise, some of the issues that Mark Davis has self-admittedly had in the past with decision-making um, was around this kind of decision. Now, it's easier when you make the right one, correct, it's, it, it, no matter how you make it. But I'm just wondering if that is, is something that is concerning And when you think about it because – he said one thing, did another, even if it works out and Antonio Pierce is incredibly successful, um, it's still for other decision-making processes down the line, it's just a little odd to me. Uh, do you feel the same way or is it? Am, am I looking too much into that? I wouldn't say it's odd necessarily because, you know, things change. People say things all the time. True. You have to watch what people do instead of what people say, right? Yeah. So Mark Davis said that he wasn't going to predetermine his uh, head coaching hire like he did with Josh McDaniels because he had he was he has mindset on hiring Josh McDaniels before the end of the regular season last year I mean at the right end of the regular season 2021 mm -hmm. excuse me and turned out to be the wrong decision so he said this time <laughs> I'm going to approach this with an open mind and apparently something happened between him making those comments and I believe November and the actual process in January uh, a lot of people say it was because of what Max Crosby said. But again, as I said, yeah. before Max Crosby made those comments, the Raiders had not requested to talk to any offensive minded head coaches or any other external candidates. And it was being reported that it was kind of odd they didn't do that. And it, now we know why it's because uh, Mark Davis had basically predetermined his decision that he was going to go into it with uh, Antonio Pierce. Now, I will say he's gone through a more extensive process for his GM position. Correct. As you said, the Raiders have not hired a GM yet. Champ Kelly's been in there already. Uh, Ed Dodds <laughs> has talked about. Those are the top two guys, Ed Dodds and Champ Kelly, as talked about right now. And then they they interviewed uh, the woman from Denver. We um, They interviewed someone from the Bills front office. They interviewed someone from the Bengals front office. So like, the, the two hiring processes were very different. But the Raiders go with the head coach first. I believe it was – I forgot which reporter, which beat reporter said it. I think it was Vix of the Athletics said that the Raiders had intended to hire the GM first, yeah. but things changed as the process went on. So, again, I will say this again. Sometimes people say things, but once you get to the actual process of doing something, things change, and I understand that. Yes. Uh, also, reports over the weekend talked about how Mark Davis uh, – the feeling was that Mark Davis did listen to the locker room, not the Max da not Max Crosby – situation that was a little bit later but that he was very in tune with the locker room and their wishes and that you know obviously going back to the days when al davis was still around and talked about his son maybe be, being too close to the locker room but in this case uh, he's being he's being i think congratulated for doing it because last time with rich Bersaccia, he did not and actually i think he made the right decision with rich Bersaccia. i think that he he went he made the wrong choice from a coaching perspective and and there was risk associated with Josh McDaniels which obviously he had not changed he had not done anything that that he had told us he was going to do when at his introductory press conference but i do think with antonio pierce there is that feeling around it and listen mark davis has a committee whether or not you think that committee is made up of the right people or not he trusts those people sandra douglas morgan of course ken harrock you mentioned richard seymour those people were in on the coaching situation. I would assume that if they felt as though now, of course, they're going to interview people in front of them, but I, 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 they worked with Antonio Pierce for the last half of the season. And so they made the choice and listen, whether or not you thought that the Raiders should have talked, we talked and, and we're not going to exhaust it again here. Cause I think it's, it's, it's old news now, but the reality is talking to other people has its benefits. Even if you aren't going to hire them, we talked about talking to a young offensive coordinator like Ben Johnson or talking to somebody like Raheem Morris, somebody like that doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to hire Antonio Pierce, but bringing them in or even doing virtual interviews has its upside. And to me, that's the only thing I wish if I am an organization, the Raiders would have done for their own benefit. But the decision itself is something that they made. He had a committee. He went about his process. It might have changed. But now I think no matter what coach you were interested in having, it's time to move forward. And the task now has to be, yeah, you're going to have Antonio Pierce can have a little bit of honeymoon here until until week one. 
Okay. Then it has to become about the winning. But the decision to go with Antonio Pierce, like you and I said all along here on the show, and if anybody wants receipts, they can go check it out, is that, hey, if you can get somebody like Jim Harbaugh, you try. If you can't, fine. Antonio Pierce has done a great job. Give him a shot. And now he gets a shot, Mo. Definitely gets a shot. I remember writing a piece on Sports Knot and, you know, pointing out the parallels between his Antonio Pierce's pathway to the Raiders head coaching job and John Madden. I'm not saying he's going to be John Madden. <laughs> no, 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 no. And win, and, and win a Super Bowl, you know, in short order. All I'm saying is that John Madden had the same pathway to the Raiders job. Yep. He went from a collegiate defensive coordinator. Antonio Pierce was in Arizona State as a, as a defensive coordinator and co-defensive coordinator. Then John Madden became a linebackers coach for the Raiders, I believe, for a year. Mm -hmm. Just like Antonio Pierce. Well, Antonio Pierce was there for two years, technically. And then John Madden became the head coach of the Raiders. So uh, a very narrow pathway. Yeah. But Antonio Pierce pulls it off. And I, and I go back to what I said about Antonio Pierce's uh, playing history is that he's used to following the narrow path. Remember, he was an undrafted free undrafted. agent. Undrafted, yeah. <laughs> coming into the NFL. So his odds were making a roster were slim. He winds up making a roster and then not only makes a roster, becomes a starter and then wins a Super Bowl with the Giants. Yeah. So, you know, no task is too big for Antonio Pierce. And a lot of a lot of a lot was said about his his situation, that the situation wasn't fair to him because, you know, he takes over Joshua Daniels staff. He takes over a team that's limited in certain areas. He's got a rookie quarterback. He's got a first year coordinator, but he still managed to go five and four. Yeah. And get that team on the on the upswing, and and that's that's partially why he deserves the job. Yeah, and 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 this this kind of argument. Well, he only beat these teams, and the, it doesn't matter. Like you still win. I mean, those some of those teams that you're talking about that they beat with bad quarterbacks or backups or whatever were teams they lost to under Josh McDaniels. So you can God. say that, but it doesn't matter. A win's a win. God, they beat Patrick Mahomes. That, like, I know. I, I know. I, I, the, that argument to <laughs> me is silly because it's like. They beat they beat the Chiefs in our head. Patrick Mahomes is the that's not check. A lot of people are still saying Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback in the league. Yes. So I, I I don't like that argument or debate that all oh, the Raiders beat back of quarterbacks because then they gloss over the Chiefs the, game, the win yeah. in our yeah. head. So and 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 that's where listen. I thought I thought look, it, it was a great win for the Raiders, no question about it. And it's tough to do it because look look what happened to the Buffalo Bills at home against the Chiefs uh, on, in the divisional playoffs this weekend, right? I mean Patrick Mahomes went in there and he beat the Bills. So you look at that, and and you can't underscore enough how important the win was, especially for Antonio Pierce, I think, for his coaching candidacy. But it was a regular season game, and you move on. Now, people comparing it to Super Bowl wins and playoff wins, I think that's taken a little too far. But to your point, yeah, okay, so he beat Austin Stick, Easton Stick. I always get his first name wrong. But but he beat Patrick Mahomes. So, so I think that that is – and listen, for those of you who were hoping for a bigger name, Fine. It's okay. Cool. All right. But now, guess what? There's risk associated with every candidate. We've talked about that numerous times too, Mo. If Jim Harbaugh or Mike Vrabel or Raheem Morris or Ben Johnson came in and coached the Raiders instead, there would still be risk associated with them. No matter how successful they've been in the past, you just don't know. It, it, it It's life. You don't know what's going to happen. Antonio Pierce has so much momentum going. He has a lot of things going for him. But he also is inexperienced. Now, you can look at the playoffs right now. You're in the AFC, NFC championship stage. Guess what? Two of the head coaches have never had experience as a coordinator, right? So if you're a, if you're a, if you're a, a Antonio Pierce fan, you look at that and say, look, they did it. Why can't he? And I can't argue with that. Now, I was one early on, especially who who harped on that a little bit, said, wow, how's he going to build a staff? And we still, we'll talk about that in the next segment. But I, I had those reservations about Antonio Pierce, but I'm looking at the playoffs and there's guys out there proving it wrong. And, and like you said, he's taken the narrow path throughout. And so guess what? Um, I wouldn't bet against the guy. Of course, he's got to prove it out, but I wouldn't bet against him, Mo, because every turn in his career, he's been able to do it. People have been watching the playoffs and saying Antonio Pierce could be what Dan Campbell is right now. Or what D'Amico Ryan's is right now. D'Amico Ryan's mm -hmm. former linebacker mm -hmm. uh, played for the Houston Texans. Uh, so a lot of people are making the comparisons there. What I will say is that for him to, I don't want to say live up to those expectations, but to get the race to the playoffs, like Dan Campbell has the Lions and Ryan's has the Texans, he's got to hit on the quarterback position. And I made this point <laughs> right after the hires that whether hold, you hold love that, the Antonio Pierce. Hold that. We're going to talk about it next segment. 
Okay. All right. Cause, cause so gonna... I'll, I'll hold that for next. Yes. Time. I'll hold it. Because I know you have something fantastic to say about mobility, M O E ability, right? <laughs> but anyway, I'll just so, say it. I'll just Finish say this. For him, for him to for him to get there. <laughs> The, he's the hire of Antonio Pierce is not going to fix all the Raiders issues no. or their main issues. I, I their main issue, I should say, no. it's a step in the right direction, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And I'll tell you about it in the next segment, how he can get the Raiders to that spot in the playoffs. Like the, like Dan Campbell has the Lions and like Ryan's has the tech. Yes. We will talk about that next segment. We're going to get into what Antonio Pierce has ahead of him. A lot of this, the quote unquote, swagger thrown around because of Antonio Pierce and the shoes he wears and the jackets he wears and all that. And that's cool. I get it. But Dan Campbell had swagger too, but there's a difference there. We're going to talk about how you have to take that swagger, that attitude you have, which now is like a throwback Raider attitude. And guess what? It has to turn into a winning culture. It doesn't matter what you listen to, what you drive, what you wear. It's all about the W's baby. And so how's Antonio Pierce going to get the Raiders from eight wins to 11 wins to where they're in the playoffs. We're going to talk about that next here on Silver and Black today. You're with Mo. You're with Scott. We are coming back. You better not go anywhere or we will find you. Welcome back. Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Mo Moten, Scott Branson back with you. Jump into the conversation with us, would you? Now, if you're crazy, we'll, we'll mute you. But but other than that, we will we will talk with you. Even if you disagree with us, it's awesome. It's cool. Check out Mo on X.com. Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully. The show is SNB Today. A hello to our YouTube viewers in the chat there. Always fun times. And yes, I know they always want us to do live shows. We're going to do some live shows. Hang in there. Hang in there. We got to make sure everybody's... Everybody's getting through the playoffs here, and then we're going to do some fun stuff. We're going to do some interactive chat with you guys and all that, so stay tuned for that. Also, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get it. If you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook or X, wherever you're watching us, make sure you subscribe to the show. And on YouTube particularly, hit the notifications bell so you know when we have a new one. All right, Mo, let's dive in now to steps for Antonio Pierce to be successful. You wrote a great piece up on 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 uh, excuse me on Bleacher Report about things that needed to happen uh, between now and the beginning of the season with Antonio Pierce, what he needed to do. I also wrote a piece on sports, not, uh, somewhat similar about three things he had to do before the draft. So I want to jump in. When you look at what Antonio Pierce has, the strengths he has, some of the areas where he needs help, one of those areas and where the Raiders need help. And I want to dive into this because you started talking about it in the last segment before I rudely interrupted you, which was, um, on offense. We'll get into the offensive coordinator position in a second. But this Raider franchise, and, and it's going to be really difficult, Mullen. Let's get into it. The quarterback position, the Raiders by far, they have lots of needs, don't get me wrong. But by far, as you can see from these NFL playoffs, okay, you've seen great quarterback play. You've seen teams in very close games end up going home because a quarterback, even a good one like Jordan Love, who I think is going to be very, very good, make a critical error towards the end of the game. It comes down to quarterback play. When you look at this Raiders team and Antonio Pierce and what his success could be, it's hinged to that quarterback position. Talk a little bit about that and what he needs to do, what this team needs to do in order to get into a position to get a quarterback that will change the game for them. So right out there, Antonio Pierce was hired. I had a piece on Bleacher Report just going through the steps it would take for the Raiders to get to be AFC playoff contenders. Mm -hmm. And one of the steps wasn't the first step, but one of the steps was getting a quarterback or revamping the Raiders quarterback room. So right now they have Aiden O'Connell, Jimmy Garoppolo, and Brian Hoyer. Oof. They're all under contract for 2024. <laughs> to me, to me, none of those guys, well, Aiden O'Connell will, in my opinion, compete for the week one job. But I don't think he would be in the driver's seat simply because we all know about his limitations. Now, don't get me wrong, Aiden O'Connell showed improvement this past season. But if you're if you're choosing between Aiden O'Connell and a rookie with high upside, I think you're probably going with the rookie with high upside. Because remember, it was Aiden O'Connell, Jimmy Garoppolo, and what did Antonio Pierce do? He went with the rookie who had more upside, yep. right, with Jimmy Garoppolo. So just 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 keep that in mind, keep that in your back pocket when you're thinking about the quarterback competition during training camp. But the Raiders have to nail the quarterback position. And that's how you get from being a mediocre squad that's hovering around 500 to getting to the playoffs. People want to compare 
Antonio Pierce to Dan Campbell and D'Amico Ryans. I see the comparisons. The energy that Dan Campbell brings to the Lions, the fact that D'Amico Ryans is a, was a former linebacker, now turned head coach and was successful. But what do they both have, Scott? They have quarterbacks <laughs> that can get them to the playoffs. Yeah. Jared Goff was 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 traded there from Los Angeles to the Rams to Detroit. They swapped quarterbacks. Matthew Stafford, of course, goes to Los Angeles, wins the Super Bowl. But Jared Goff has kind of had a career, you know, rebirth in Detroit. Now he's behind one of the best offensive lines in the league, yes. and that's why, even though he's not very mobile, he's able to put up points and put up yards and put up touchdown passes because he has an elite offensive line. But he he is a a pretty decent quarterback. Even before he got to Detroit, let's remember Jared Goff had been to a Super yes. Bowl. Yes, don't forget and, that. And not only that, Mo, but he was the number one pick in the draft. Now, I you and I talk right. about the functional mobility piece and quarterbacks, and that's what you want. And people argue with us all the time and say, "Well, no, you can have a pocket passer." And Jared Goff is more of a pocket pass. He's more of a, and I don't mean this from a negative standpoint, a system quarterback in that system with that offensive line. He works perfectly because you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't turn the ball over a lot. Right. And that was his problem. Ironically, that was his problem in Los Angeles. Correct. And that's why if you read up on why McVay traded traded golf to Detroit, it's because of those turnovers, <laughs> critical turnovers. Yep. Now, he's fixed that issue. Now, Detroit has a better offensive line than the Rams had when golf was there. And again, it works for golf as a pocket pass quarterback because Detroit has one of the best offensive lines in the league. Now, in Houston... Different route. Houston was a laughing stock last year. They draft CJ Stroud. All of a sudden, now Houston is pretty good. Now, all of a sudden, Houston has a bright future. They went from being a complete dumpster fire to having a bright future. What changed in a year? Mm -hmm. They nailed the head coach, D'Amico Ryans, and they nailed the quarterback position. They draft CJ Stroud. He's the front runner free for offensive rookie of the year for good reason. But that team didn't even have a number one wide receiver for most of the year. Tank Dell came along, but he got hurt in December. Right. And the, and the Texans still go to the playoffs. They still win a playoff game. Why? Because they have the quarterback to do it. So, again, whether you whether you love or hate the Antonio Pierce hire, the Raiders have to get the quarterback position right. And if they do that, Antonio Pierce will have relative success. Now, of course, of course, you also have to develop that quarterback. So once you get that quarterback, got to have a solid offensive line. Even if he is mobile, got to have a solid offensive line. And got to have an offensive system, an offensive coordinator who puts that quarterback in the best position to succeed. Right, which is why we've talked about it possibly the availability of Justin Fields, who I think, as you just described, was in a situation where he didn't have a good offensive line. He's gone through multiple offensive coordinators, okay, and hasn't had somebody, I think, there to put him in a position to succeed. Not excusing some of his downsides. Those are things that you have to work on. But I think that's a good example of, yeah, you can sometimes get a talented quarterback, but if they're in the wrong situation, they might not reach their potential. And that's the thing. The path for the Raiders, Mo, to get a quarterback, people are like, well, they're picking 13, so those three quarterbacks are going to go in the first four picks. And that may be true. I am of, and we've talked about this going back to last year when we're covering the draft, I am of the opinion that the Raiders do whatever they can to get up there. People, oh, you can't give away too much draft picks. Why? You're talking about the quarterback position. If you, I'm not, look, I don't think you can get Caleb Williams. I think he's going to go to the Bears. So I don't think he's going to, I don't think they trade out a number one. Okay. But number two and number three, if, if you like May or if you like Jaden Daniels, who I, I predicted the, the Raiders would move up to get Jaden Daniels, I would go do it. Like it doesn't matter what it costs. You need that guy. And if you believe he's that guy, you can do that. Now, we've also talked about, yeah, you might be able to get a guy in the second round too. You got the Bo Nixes, you got even Michael Penix Jr., some of these other players. But if you really want that guy, Jaden Daniels obviously has the history with Antonio Pierce going back to Arizona State. So there's some synergy there. Uh, but but to me, they have to do whatever they can. If they can't get up there to get one of those guys, then you got to have a strong plan B, which could include, yes, taking somebody in the second round doesn't mean they can't be successful. And plan C is, or plan 1B is a veteran and there's not that great of veterans out there. You talked about Jacoby Brissett. I mean, obviously Kirk Cousins is a big one out there. Devonta Adams was on a podcast recently, talked about how he likes Kirk Cousins. So you can infer from that what you want, but um, the path to the quarterback, they have to have multiple routes, Mo, but it has to be priority one. It's gotta be priority one. And I just want to reiterate this. I'm not saying that Justin Fields is the answer for no. the that quarterback. All I'm saying is that if the Raiders are stuck in a position where they they can't move up 
for one in the draft and they have to stand pat at 13 and they may not like their options, you bring in a low cost veteran. Again, Justin Fields is only going to cost six million against the cap. Right. You bring him in and have him compete. You don't just hand him the job. You say, well, we'll put Justin Fields in a stable environment with a good OC and see what he does. And if he's if he's pretty good, if he has a career turnaround like Geno Smith in Seattle or Baker Mayfield in Tampa Bay, then we'll see what it, where it goes by the end of the season and we'll make a decision there. But for now, we just want a serviceable, serviceable quarterback who could start week one and compete with Aiden O'Connell for the job. I will also say that as far as options, quarterback options in the draft are concerned, I think people need to start talking more about Cam Ward, mm -hmm. who's at Washington State and declared for the draft because Cam Ward can actually – he may go at the end of the first round. So let's say the Raiders don't like their options at 13 and they decide to move back several a few spots. Cam Ward, I think, is going to be available at the end of the first round. So if they like Cam Ward, his arm talent, his mobility, then that could be an option for the Raiders. I think people need – if, if it's not Bo Nix or Michael Penix, because that's what, who a lot of people are focusing on, Add Cam Ward to the conversation because he's a possibility at the end of the first round, maybe early second round. Yeah, and I think that the situation with 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 Fields is interesting. People, oh, you're gonna have to pay. He's coming to the end of his contract. He's gonna have to make forty million dollars, uh, forty five million dollars next season. Okay, so if he comes in and balls out and becomes the quarterback, some the Bears thought he could be when they drafted him in the first round. So what? <laughs> right? I mean, if right. if he comes out next year, leads the Raiders to the playoffs and 11, 12 wins. I know, I know. I'm just going out there. Listen to me for a second. And he does that, then give him the $40 million. Who cares? Like, if he if he succeeds, great. If he doesn't, like you said, it's $6 million. You let him out. He's got a fifth-year option, technically, right? So on that option, you could even tag him. Now, you don't have – I don't think they would. But if he doesn't succeed, you let him go, and then you're you're back to square one. And at least you gave that a shot. In addition, you drafted a rookie, perhaps, and you got the rookie, Justin Fields, and Aiden O'Connell in camp. I don't think you can lose there. But let's walk through the two scenarios. So let's say the Raiders acquired Justin Fields. I wouldn't give up more than a third round pick. Right. That's what honestly. I said. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even I wouldn't even go with a second. I would say a third round pick, take it or leave it, Bears, whatever. We'll move on if you don't take the third round pick. But a right. third round pick is not gonna hurt. Um, I will say this. Let's say let's walk through the two scenarios. Let's say Justin Fields goes to Las Vegas, Champ Kelly is in the front office. Champ Kelly was in Chicago when the Bears drafted Justin Fields. So that's where I'm making the connection. Not just that he's a low-cost option, but there is some connection there with Champ Kelly if Champ Kelly remains with the front office. Mm -hmm. Let's say Justin Fields gets to Vegas and he stinks. He doesn't He doesn't look anything like a first-round pick. He He's floundering. He's turning the ball over. He's hurt. Okay, you know, his cap hit, as you said, as I said, is only $6 million. You move on. You throw the rookie out there and say, okay, Justin Fields played for six weeks. He isn't any good. A O'Connell or the rookie go out there and, and finish the season. Scenario two is Justin Fields goes there and he plays well. And people say, well, then you're going to have to pay him. That That's the perfect situation to use the franchise tag. Right. Guy comes to your team, one year has a decent or good season, you franchise tag him. That's exactly what the Giants should have done with Daniel Jones, yes. by the way. Daniel Jones <laughs> was, in, was in New York. Yeah. But he had one good season and the Giants paid him. That, turned, that looks like a mistake right now. You don't have to pay Justin Fields. You could decline his fifth-year option, which will make him a free agent in 2025. If he plays well, then you franchise tag yeah. him. And you say, okay, you had one good year. Prove it again. And if he isn't able to prove it again, you still have your rookie. You still have Aiden O'Connell in your back pocket. If he proves it again, then you have another decision to make after the 2025 season. But that's so far down the road. You're not worried about two years. You're worried about winning right now because I think the Raiders – I know you said the Raiders have several spots to fill in their roster, but I think with a quarterback, they can make the jump from eight and nine to 11 and six and be a playoff team, yeah. in my opinion. So the win now window could be open if you get the right quarterback. Well, and that's what that's what I think it is. And that's where that's where I want to transition after talking about the quarterback <clears throat> to the offensive coordinator and how important that position is going to be. We've heard some names bantied around, um, one of which they need to stay away from. And we'll talk about that. But you look at what they're going to do there, especially knowing that you're going to bring in new quarterbacks, whether they're veterans or rookies, whatever, you need somebody on that side. Antonio Pierce is going to need somebody who can come in and I think is is at the forefront of uh, offense in the NFL, who knows the modern offense, who knows the progressiveness of what's happening in the NFL game. Uh, I mean, I, 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 don't, I think most people understand this, Mo, but just talk about how important it's going to be for that staff as he puts it together 
if Patrick Graham does end up staying, which we don't know if he will, if he does stay, then the defensive side's fine. They they got rid of a bunch of position coaches. You expected that. They were Josh McDaniel hired. So that Patrick Graham's going to fill that if he's still there. But on the offensive side, they're pretty much cleaning house. Um, just talk about the importance of that role and and going forward, how important it's going to be for Antonio Pierce to succeed as a head coach. Well, he's got to name an offensive coordinator, and that's that's going to be part of how successful he's going to be because it's one thing to get the quarterback, but you got to get an offensive coordinator who has, to me, I, I would want an innovative system correct? Uh, that can accentuate the quarterback's strengths and hide and mask his weaknesses. So he's got to nail the offensive coordinator higher, and I think that's that's the most important hire on his staff. Now, he's brought in Mark uh, Marvin Lewis officially. Marvin Lewis is kind of like a consultant this past season. Uh, to help Antonio Pierce along. But now Marvin Lewis is going to be an official part of this Raiders, this new Raiders coaching staff. Tom Coughlin may not be on the staff, but Antonio Pierce will lean on him from advice. Now, remember, he played under uh, Tom Coughlin at, when he won that Super Bowl with the Giants. So he's got older, more experienced head coaches that are going to be giving him guidance, which is a good thing. So I think that's where his offense coordinator candidates could come from. There are some, there are two names now because one name has been hired uh, as of Monday morning. Shane Waldron mm -hmm. has been hired to be the Bears offense coordinator. So there are names out there that have been connected to Antonio Pierce, which we'll see which one he settles on. Cliff Kingsbury talked about in the show. Luke Getze was in Albert Breer's piece. I wouldn't touch Luke Getze, especially if you're going to bring in Justin Fields because the Luke <laughs> Getze-Justin Fields combination bad. did not work in Chicago. Yeah. So the Raiders are thinking about bringing in Justin Fields. Luke Getze is probably not going to be an option. If they go in another direction, who knows? I'm sure they may interview him. Who knows what, what it's going to be? But I think for Antonio Pierce to be successful, we talked about the quarterback position, the most important hire. And I said this even during his interview process is, who is he going to name his offensive coordinator? Because that guy is going to be in full control of the offense and developing that quarterback. Yeah, it's going to be huge. And and that's the problem. The Raiders, I, I, I firmly believe if, if they didn't make the playoffs, they would have been in much stronger contention. It was a tough AFC this year for a playoff spot had their offense been even 30% better than it was because it was that putrid. It was that bad. Uh, and so so it, it's vital that he finds that because the defense obviously is in a good spot. They, they need to supplement that with a couple guys here and there, but I agree with you. I think they're on the cusp of being a playoff team, no question whatsoever. So they just need to make it move. Before we move on to the next segment and take a quick break, also want to talk about something. You talked about this, this being a very important position, the most important position that, that Antonio Pierce can hire because of the quarterback, because of the offensive needs. To me, then, it becomes, and we just talked about the fact that they don't need a ton of people. It's not like they are – what the Texans were. People thought the Texans were going to win three or four games. They end up going to the playoffs. The Raiders are there. The Raiders had eight wins. Okay. So to, to expect 10 wins next year is kind of the floor is not out of the question. In fact, I think the expectations are higher. And with all the excitement around Antonio Pierce, if he didn't win 10 games now, depending what happens uh, as far as player personnel goes, especially quarterback, um, that would be disappointing. So, we talk about him bringing back the Raider way and the attitude and all that kind of stuff. And I know fans love that because it's a romanticized 40 year old um, kind of construct. And I get it. That's part of what the Raiders brand is. And it's great that he's bringing it back, so to speak. At the same time, what the Raiders haven't had in that time is a culture of winning. So you can have swagger, you can be bad, you can do all that stuff, but you need to win. So the pressure on coaches to win, especially somebody coming in who came in on a nice swell, a nice high because he went five and four after taking over from McDaniels, the, the expectations will be pretty high for a rookie head coach. Don't you believe? I think the expectations will be to improve on what you did last year. Uh, I, you know, I don't think anybody's going to be picking a race to win the Super Bowl. No, but I, I would think that if you find a quarterback in the draft with high upside, or you get a veter a serviceable veteran who is an upgrade over eight and O'Connell, you, you you're expecting to go from eight nine to a winning record at least. <laughs> and if you have a winning record, then you have a shot to make the playoffs. Now this year you would have needed ten wins to get into the best, just to be the number seven seed. Yeah. The Steelers had ten wins. Yeah. And they were the seven C and they got in with help, by the way. Help, yeah. They needed <laughs> they Lots needed the, they needed, you know, they needed help to get in the last week of the season. So 
it, if it's all about the quarterback position, it's all about offense. I know people love, love to say defense wins championships, but I think that's an outdated adage now because look, just look at the teams in the playoffs. You know, some of those teams didn't have, you know, the strongest defenses. Look at the Detroit Lions. Their defense is not – It's it made stops against the Buccaneers when it had to, but the Lions don't have a shutdown defense. I mean, I mean, think if you if you think about it, now the Ravens, yeah. arguably the number one defense in the league, oh, yeah. but their offense is also dynamic with Lamar Jackson. Correct. The Chiefs' offense hasn't been what it was in previous years, but if you watch that game against the Bills, it was back and forth. It was an offensive game. Yeah. So and and so people like to say defense, 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 and the Raiders have that to me with Patrick Graham assuming he stays. But considering that Antonio Pierce, even on his watch, the Raiders. Before Antonio Pierce got there, the Raiders didn't score more than 21 points in a game. Now, once he took over for Josh McDaniels, they did it three times. But in the other six games, they didn't score more than 21 points. So right. the Raiders have to be able to consistently score at least three touchdowns or more in a game with some field goals, maybe in between. But you always want to score six. But my point is that offense now in today's league where the rules favor the offense you can't just depend on your defense to bail you out every week. We saw that with this team this past season. The offense has to be running, not necessarily a well-owned machine, but it has to be at least decent. Well, and you have to have balance. I think you brought up the Chiefs. It's a good example, which is their offense is not, you know, before you go back two, three years ago, their offense was on fire, right? And their defense was middle of the road at best, sometimes lower than that. In fact, I think the one year they won the Super Bowl, they were like 24th or whatever it was in defense. But it was it was out of balance. But the offense was so good it made up for defensive deficiencies. Now the Chiefs have some offensive deficiencies, not a quarterback, but some other places, and the defense is better. So you have more of a balance. You have more of that. So I think to your point, it's not you can't just the days of Trent Dilfer winning a Super Bowl because that Baltimore defense was so dominating. That doesn't happen anymore. It just doesn't happen that way. You have to have some more balance there. Um, and clearly, the offensive minded coaches are the ones that are doing a good job. Even if they were Dan Campbell, yeah, a defensive guy, right? Uh, I mean, you'd think he's a defensive guy. And to your point about the Lions, they do well enough, but they're not some defensive juggernaut. So uh, very, very good point. All right, we're going to take our final break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the GM position. Oh, yeah, general manager. The Raiders don't have one of those yet. <laughs> we'll talk about that when we come back here on Silver and Black today. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. We're here on the home stretch on Silver and Black today, the Tuesday edition in late January as we approach the AFC NFC Championship games coming up this weekend. No, they're not in Kansas City, but Kansas City's in it. I know everybody out there in Raider Nation will be rooting for the Ravens <laughs> this this Sunday uh, as the games the, yeah. kick off, right? And the Lions. And the Lions, too. They're yes, the for 49ers. Ravens and Lions. Yeah. Yes, it'll be it'll be interesting. <laughs> Uh, to say the least. All right, we're going to uh, close the show talking about the general manager opening. Mo, we 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 know that from reporting out there that the the holdup here is reportedly because there is a big push. Ken Herrock being one of them, at least that's how it's reported, uh, pushing for Ed Dodds. Uh, Champ Kelly there went through interviews, sat in on some of the the quote unquote head coaching interviews. And um, so there seems to be some hold up there, or as you talked about over the weekend in your social media channels, perhaps your dream of having a two headed monster in the front office, having Ed Dodds and Champ Kelly on staff might be something they're trying to work on. Uh, other reporting says that Ed Dodds feels really good about this and that, that they're trying to close something out. What do you make of this and, and, and the process and how long it's taking to get this GM position announced? If you remember in the first segment, I said things changed. The Raiders wanted to hire a GM first and then a head coach. I think what they what, what Mark Davis ran into was, okay, we know we want Antonio Pierce to be our head coach, but we have a tough decision between Champ Kelly, who was the interim, to go for Dave Ziegler, and who some someone who Mark Davis said he liked in the interview process before he hired Dave Ziegler and Josh McDaniels as a potential GM, and Ed Dodds, who Ian Rappaport said was – a top candidate and would have likely got the job if it wasn't Dave Ziegler and Josh Daniels as a package deal. So you got rap sheet saying it would have been Ed Dodds as GM if it was the Patriot way. And you got Mark Davis saying he would have gave strong consideration to champ. Kelly. so what that tells me is that maybe the brain trust of the Raiders is split between the two candidates. Now, I don't think you can go wrong with either candidate, either. Yeah. but, but Ed Dodds is Ed Dodds is the more, sought after candidate he's interviewed for multiple jobs Chant kelly's only been 
uh, connected to the Panthers GM job. That's the only interview I know of that I've seen in reports that he's gone to. So clearly Ed Dodds is the more appealing candidate around the league. Yeah. So I think it, let's say the Raiders do keep champ Kelly and hire Ed Dodds. I think it would be Ed Dodds as the GM and then champ Kelly in another position, maybe president of football operations. Who knows? Yeah. But I think, I think, if Ed Dodds is hired, he's going to be the GM, not Champ Kelly. I just want to put that out there. But I will say that for once, I think Raider Nation, at least the, the fans that I interact with on the X Twitter, they would be happy with either decision like mm -hmm. Now, there are some people, of course, that don't want Ed Dodds because they think Champ Kelly deserves it. And there's some people that say they don't want Champ Kelly, they prefer Ed Dodds. But for the most part, from what I've seen, I'm not speaking for all Raider fans, of course, but from what I've seen, fans are are – would be okay with either now i i'm trying to be greedy i'm trying to say <laughs> keep both of them <laughs> you know get the get the continuity keep the continuity with champ kelly and bring in a new mind like ed dodson having to work together we'll see if that works out Vinny bonson your our friend at the uh las vegas Review journal said that league circles are saying that the rays may be trying to keep both yeah of them, so we'll and that's what might that's what might be taking long enough is to figure out how that would work a lot of people well who would make the final decision i agree with you i think that if ed dodds comes into the raiders He's going to be the number one uh, player personnel guy there, i.e. the GM or whatever they want to call it. Who knows if they change the roles up. Uh, and I don't think if Champ Kelly just went back to being an assistant GM, I don't think he necessarily leaves, Mo. A lot of people are like, well, if you don't give him the job, he's going to leave. Not necessarily. Like you said, he interviewed for just the Panthers role. He's interviewed for other GM roles over the last couple of years at the same times he did with the Raiders. He also did it in Chicago when he was there um, and didn't get those positions. So, you know, it, it's going to depend on where what opportunities he has. But I also right. think that, you know, if he can work with Ed Dodds uh, and, 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 and be comfortable there and he likes Las Vegas, he's a family guy and maybe they're settled in, they don't want to go somewhere, then I don't think he's an absolute – uh, uh, a goner if if Ed Dodds is the GM and he's even assistant GM. Now, if he's president of operations or whatever and, and, and has some new title that would help him, obviously, hey, thanks for doing a great job as interim, giving you a little bit of a, a bump up here. But I, I just don't think it has to be either or. I think it can be it can be and. Two things. So one, I like Champ Kelly. You know, if he they hire him as a GM, I think he does, you know, he deserves a shot. Mm -hmm. But as we've just said, if to the people that say Champ Kelly is just going to leave, where where else is he going to go to get a general manager job? If it's not with the Panthers, he has again he hasn't been connected to any other general manager job. Right. So either you stay with the Raiders organization and help Ed Dodds build what you helped build initially, right. or you go, you know, to another front office, but you're not going to be GM in that front office unless it's the Panthers either. Mm -hmm. The second thing I want to know here is that there's a nugget that that I think Vinny Bonsignor dropped on the X Twitter. And he said, keep in mind that Antonio Pierce and Ed Dodds had the same agent. Mm -hmm. So just that, that, that sometimes plays into some of these decisions, you know, players sometimes have the same agent to go to the same team. Yeah. In this case, it's a head coach and, a, and the GM candidate. Just keep in mind that Ed Dodds and Antonio Pierce have the same agent. So if Ed Dodds, becomes a GM and you say, well, what's the connection without Harbaugh? Because if you remember, Scott, oh, yeah, it was all Harbaugh. That Ed Dodds, it was people thought that Ed Dodds and Jim Harbaugh was going to be the, you know, the combo. Yeah. But people, some people didn't realize, and I didn't realize this, that Dodds and AP also could be a combo because they have the same age. Yes. So there's some, maybe some familiarity there. Yeah, there you go. And uh, Dodds, this history with Harbaugh with the Raiders, as they were both at there at the same time in Oakland, makes a lot of sense. But yeah, there's always something else going on to the surface, man. There's always something happening there. But it'll be interesting. And again, we're recording this on on Monday. So if if they name the 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 general manager on Monday, early Tuesday morning, then that conversation might be a little bit dated. But either way, it's I I, I can't I can't believe it won't be one of those two guys. And and like you said, I mean I wrote a piece back in December advocating that Champ Kelly get the job. Um, now, Ed Dodd's in the picture. I agree with you. I think based on his experience and what he's done would be my number one choice there. Uh, although, like you said, you can't go wrong with either guy because I do think Champ Kelly deserves an opportunity to be a GM. If it's not this year, then I think if he stays with the Raiders and they can put together a really nice draft, they have a nice season next year, he'll yeah. be in an even better position to yeah. get a role somewhere around the NFL, and that's usually how it works. Mm -hmm. All right, Mel, we're going to conclude this edition of the show. What do you got coming up this week you need to let people know about? Got a sports not sports not piece. Uh, if if the Raiders don't hire an OC 
by Thursday, I will have my top five offensive coordinator candidates. Uh, we talked about a couple today. As I said, Shane Waldron will become the offensive coordinator for the Bears, so he's off the board. Uh, Luke Getzey is still out there. He's probably not going to make my list of candidates, though. <laughs> and <laughs> Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury's out there. But there are also some other names out there that I'll, that I'll bring up and, and talk about in, as potential hires under Antonio Pierce. All right. See, there you go. We will also have another show later this week. We'll get to, to some of your mail. So make sure you call in 702-900-7869. 702-900-7869. Tell us what you think about everything that's going on with the Raiders. The, the, the coaching hire... <laughs> The GM hire, Mo's hat, whatever it is, whatever it is, just you know, let us know what you think. <laughs> we'll get to an edition of the Raider Nation mailbag uh, as part of our show later in the week. Also, make sure you check out Mo's work up on Bleacher Report around the whole NFL. Make sure you know what's going on. I know the Raiders are your team, but trust me, the more you know about what's happening in the league, the, the better off you will be. I I know you don't have a lot of time, so you, you focus on your Raiders. But make sure you check it out. Make sure you check out his work there. Also, check out sportsnot.com when his column's up there. You can also check out my work there as well as we'll talk about uh, the Raiders and other things happening. Mo, we will talk to you later in the week, my friend. Talk to you soon. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for Mo Moten, I'm Scott Cobrans. And this has been Silver and Black today. You guys have a great week, and we'll talk to you next time.